Hi everyone, my name is Julie Mock and I'm the Conservation Director for the Colorado Mountain Club. I'm super excited to be here today to talk to you about our Recreation Impact Monitoring System and mobile application. Um, in this time of COVID, I know it's weird being in a virtual setting, um, but appreciate you all tuning in um, and definitely encourage you to enter questions in the chat um, throughout the session and we'll be answering those as quickly as we can. Um, but we'll go ahead and jump in. I wanted to just give you a little bit of background on myself since I'm not able to meet you all in person at this event. Um, but again, my name is Julie Mock. I work as a conservation director for the Colorado Mountain Club. I'm based in Salida, Colorado, which is a central part of the state, basically in the middle of the, the mountains at about 7,000 feet, um, surrounded by peaks and rivers and high desert. Um, and you know, really I, I live in Colorado and do this work um, because of the outdoor recreation, the access that we have here. Um, and all over. I grew up in California on the East Bay and really kind of found my love for nature in the regional parks there and in camping and skiing in the Sierra and just exploring the incredible resources that we have on our, our public lands. Um, so the work we do at the Colorado Mountain Club is important to protecting those not only here in Colorado, um, but around the country as we'll talk about today. Just a little more background on CMC as well. Um, we are one of the oldest recreation organizations in the country. We are founded in 1912 and really we're a, a social club organization of about 7,500 folks across Colorado who are lovers of the outdoors. They're hikers, uh, mountain climbers, backcountry skiers, um, and, and more. And really a lot of our programming is based around getting people outdoors, helping them gain skills um, and networks to recreate safely on, on public land. So we have a lot of uh, classes and courses that are available to our members. Um, we also have a, a robust youth education program focused on getting kids out into the outdoors and again, gaining those, those rock climbing skills or um, backcountry travel skills um, to be safe in, in the outdoors. And um, we do a number of, of trips and events, um, both across the state, but also across the country and, and nationwide in non-COVID times when we're able to travel. Um, Within that, we also have a, a conservation department, and this is again key to making sure that, that these public lands and recreation opportunities remain available um, for, for future generations. Um, in the conservation department, we really focus on, on advocacy and stewardship related to outdoor recreation. So again, making sure we have access to public lands, but also making sure that access and that impact is balanced with natural resource conservation and, and landscape preservation. Um, and that's really how we um, got into the, the RIMS program and this concept of recreation impact monitoring to make sure we understand what impact we're having on the ground and what we can do to, to mitigate it. So we'll talk about our, our RIMS program today. And again, RIMS stands for Recreation Impact Monitoring System. Um, and this really grew out of the stewardship components of CMC's programming. So we actually run trail crews that go out and do maintenance on public lands, um, habitat restoration, campground cleanups, fencing, whatever it might be. Work really closely with both our federal land managers in Colorado, as well as state and local land managers. Um, but what we're finding is, you know, we're sending our crews out, we have a couple of of weeks of funding and especially in the more remote parts of the state um, where staffing was was really tight either for the forest service or, or other partners um, we'd send our crew out and, and not really have a lot of information about what they needed to do on the ground um, the the rec managers in the area maybe hadn't been out on their trails in the last few years they really didn't know what we would find out there as far as down trees or erosion issues or that sort of thing so it was hard to be as efficient as we wanted to be with our crews and with the you know short amount of time that we had, not knowing what we were going to find out there on the ground. So what we started doing was, was collecting information. Our crews would go out with saws and, you know, a, a kind of small tool cache, cover as much ground as they can um, and do work on the ground, but then also bring information back to those land managers so that the next group going out, whether that was their trail crew or a volunteer crew or our crew coming back the following year, would have more information about what the high priority issues were along the trail and how they might want to prioritize their time and tools and, and that sort of thing. 
Um, so that's really where RIMS, RIMS came from. Again, we were seeing these, these data gaps, um, both on the agency side when it came to monitoring, um, but also in the kind of citizen science component, especially in regards to recreation data. Um, a lot of the monitoring that does take place on public lands is, is really great and we don't want to replace that, but we want to find a better tool um, to do that monitoring work more efficiently and get it into the hands of volunteers and local users. Um, a lot of the agency monitoring, as you probably know, um, is pretty general. Visitor use monitoring for the Forest Service, for example, only happens at, at the forest level. So you get this aggregate number um, of how many users are, are coming to the forest each year, but you don't get the localized information, how many folks are showing up at a given trailhead on a Saturday in the middle of the summer. Um, on the flip side of that, we see a lot of kind of local citizen science groups or local trail monitoring um, that happens in, in one small area, um, but can't be replicated in, in other locations um, or is really specific to a given geographic reach. Um, so having a tool that can really span across different geographies is, is key. Um, we saw a lot of inconsistency across agencies and different groups, right? We're monitoring for different things. We're asking different questions, even if we're trying to get at the same data. So we wanna do um, you know, some, some optimization so that we're gathering the right type of information and it can be used across you know, broad, broad, again, landscapes and, and geographic areas. The other big thing that we've noticed with monitoring, especially when it's um, you know, conducted by the agency, is it's pretty inaccessible to the public. Um, and when volunteer groups are using tools like Art Collector or Survey123, it can be great to, to kind of crowdsource that information, but then it goes to the agency and, and you know, volunteers can't see what happens to it um, and they're not able to access that data local stewardship groups can't can't get a hold of it very easily that sort of thing um, so we wanted something that was a little bit more public facing and accessible to other other types of groups um, and then we saw a lot of opportunities here too um, you know again the, the agencies and local groups are doing a lot of this monitoring on their own but to be able to leverage the power of crowdsourcing is is a huge opportunity um, you've got you know thousands of recreationists a day going out on these these public lands with an opportunity to bring information back and so we were looking to to create a tool to to really do that um, and then we want to see data diff driven decision making um, and really, you know, again, I think in the recreation sphere, even more so than in, you know, say natural resources, um, the data is, is anecdotal at best, right, as far as visitor use goes or as far as trends and changes and impacts on the ground. Um, so to have all that information coalesced in one place is going to help with that data driven decision making. Um, and then again, an efficient use of resources, right? We want to capitalize on the volunteers that we have, the trail crews that we have, and the other limited resources that we have to put into public land management and make sure we're doing that in an efficient and effective way. So I'm gonna walk through the different components of the RIMS mobile app and the, the program as a whole. Um, the app itself is, is really just one part of this bigger project and it's, it's the collection tool, right? It's what we give to um, volunteers and to the general public to gather information while they're out on public lands. Um, but that tool then feeds all of the data into a, a cloud hosted data repository. So you sync up the information from your phone or, or mobile device, and we store that in the cloud um, so that it can be accessible in a number of, of different ways. Um, the other cool thing about the data repository is we have the opportunity to pull in other data sources. So whether that's you know, 10 years of, of campsite monitoring that the Forest Service has already been doing, or it's visitor use data from trail counters, or um, it's open source Facebook or, or um, Strava data that, that we're able to pull in. Um, we can bring all these data sources together and create a more comprehensive picture of what's happening out there on the ground. Um, we can crank all of that through a series of algorithms and, and basically pump out dashboards on the back end. We'll look at these closely today, um, but the, the dashboards are really where the land managers and the agencies can interact with the data. Um, they can look at charts and graphs and maps 
and really understand um, more comprehensively what is going out there on, on public lands. So the mobile app, um, again, I mentioned is the, the data collection tool. Um, and we've spent a couple of years kind of developing this, working really closely with land managers um, and really optimizing the information that we're collecting for land managers. I think that's one thing that kind of makes rooms a little bit different than a lot of the other apps that are out there for navigation and for visitor use kind of optimization. Um, the information we're collecting in rooms is really meant for land managers. So essentially, once you get into the app, um, anytime you submit a report, um, you're going to drop a pin and go through a series of drop down surveys um, to collect information about a specific type of, of assessment. So we've got a visitor use assessment, a trail assessment, a camping assessment, a signs and facilities assessment, and then a stewardship report. We're actually also right now working on a, a new wildlife encounters assessment that will add to this list. Um, and the cool thing with RIMS is that we can add these custom assessments or these new modules over time as we you know, hear from managers that they need information on different types of, of monitoring. Um, you can add photos to any of these assessments um, from just you know, the camera on your phone. Um, and then of course you can use all of these features offline. So if you're in the back country, you're in an area where there's not cell service, you can collect all the information, store it locally on your phone and then sync it up to the cloud when you get back into Wi-Fi service. The app itself is totally free. We want to, you know, minimize kind of the barriers to entry for volunteers and users. So they can download it from Google Play or the Apple App Store. Um, and then we actually have a training video and a short quiz that we have users take um, to go from just being a, a basic, what we call a public user, um, to a volunteer user. Um, if you're fiddling with your phone and download the app right now. Um, you can search CMC RIMS in the Google Play or App Store. Um, you'll actually see a, a more limited option as far as assessments go as a public user if you haven't done that training yet. So you can do just a simple, a quick report um, as well as a visitor use report, but you're not gonna see the full trail assessment or the camping assessment, that sort of thing. Um, our goal with the training really is just to get people bought into the app um, and then make sure we cover basic terminology um, and sort of features within the app so people are using it consistently and we're collecting good data. All of the training and information is available um, at cmc.org slash RIMS, and we'll make sure to put that into the chat um, and have it available for folks to, to check out as well. So in the app itself here, just a few screenshots of, of kind of some of the different drop downs and, and metrics that we have included. Um, you're always going to enter a location name when you start an assessment, and then your mobile device is going to automatically grab your coordinates um, from the location you're at. We've got some options. You can actually change those coordinates if you're retroactively doing an assessment, that sort of thing. Um, but every assessment is going to be associated with a GPS point so that we can put it on a map. Um, I mentioned you can take photos in any of the assessments and we of course advise users um, not to take photos of, of people or you know occupied campsites, that sort of thing, um, just to make sure that we're being respectful of, of the public's privacy and that sort of thing. Um, in the trail assessment, we really focus the questions and metrics here on um, issues that you're gonna see on the ground. So we've got tread issues like erosion and widening and berms and narrowing, all those sorts of things. Um, the tread surface type, you can add additional comments. Um, we talk about corridor and down trees um, and diameter of the down trees, right? So we have enough information for a crew to actually go out and, and deal with the issue. There's a ton of different metrics in the trail assessment, um, but as a user, you don't have to fill out all of them, right? If you just are noting a down tree in about probably 10 to 15 seconds, you can jump in, hit a couple drop downs, um, and you know take a picture and, and save. So the trail assessment is really kind of incident or, or issue based. The campsite assessment's a little bit different. Um, we really set it up to be more like a comprehensive inventory of a dispersed camping location. 
So you're going to measure things like the total area of just of ground disturbance, um, the number of fire rings, um, whether or not it's close to water or other natural resources. Is there trash or there other impacts like social trails and, and those sorts of things. So it's a little bit more comprehensive. Um, but again, you're going to only fill out the, the components or the questions that are appropriate to that given site. Um, and then we've got our visitor use uh, module, which is really focused on people and activity. Um, so you actually tag, you know, that you see four mountain bikers and five hikers and three dogs off leash um, and, you know, any other types of technology like e-bikes or drones or that sort of thing. Um, and then we also have a parking component within that as well. So you can classify cars based on the, the license plate if you want to get really detailed, or you can just say, hey, there's, there's 40 cars in the parking lot when I showed up at the trailhead today. Um, we can note things like overflowed parking or people parking in areas where they shouldn't be. Um, and we do encourage folks to, our users to take pictures of that so we can kind of document and help land managers understand what those, those parking issues are, are really looking like on the ground. A Couple of just examples from completed assessments. So, once you're actually in the app, um, you complete an assessment, you can save it, you can view all of your own assessments, you can actually view other people's assessments as well, which is a really helpful tool, um, either as a user or, or as a manager, right, or a stewardship crew. If you're getting ready to go out um, and hike a trail, you can check and see if there are other assessments that have been done before you go out um, and see the information that was provided by other users. Um, all the details of the metrics that, they, that that they completed, as well as the photos and notes and things like that. Um, so again, these are just screenshots from within the app itself to give you a sense for what it looks like. A couple of other features that we have in the app, I mentioned that you can view other assessments. You can also do some basic filtering. So if you just wanna see the most recent assessments from the last week, you can filter by date, zoom into your area of interest, um, and see how many new assessments have been submitted. And again, you can open up each of those assessments and look at the, the information and the photos that were submitted. You can also edit your own assessments and save them as a draft, which is really helpful when you're out in the field. If you're moving quickly, you just wanna take a quick picture and a couple short notes, you can come back to that draft assessment later um, and fill in the rest of the details when you're in the comfort of your own home. Um, Another cool thing is that you can reassess previously submitted data. Um, so for example, if uh, a volunteer had been out two weeks ago and noted a down tree um, and you come through two weeks later and that tree has been cleared or you're the one that's clearing it, you can reassess that survey note that the down tree has been removed and then archive it. So it's kind of hidden within the app. We still retain that data. So we know that there was a down tree there and that it was removed. Um, but it's not going to kind of clutter up the app. Um, also a really cool tool for things like campsites, right? So that over time you can actually build um, a site assessment or an inventory year after year. You go back and reassess the same site and note whether the area of disturbance has per potentially grown by, you know, 100 square feet or a thousand square feet or whatever it might be, um, or that new fire rings have, have developed, or there's some other different type of, of impact over time. Another feature within the app is we have some basic issue flagging, and these are triggers that we've built into the app um, to identify, you know, bigger issues that as land managers we'd want to address sooner rather than later. So, you know, if there's one down tree across the trail, maybe not a huge deal, but if it's over 24 inches in diameter, we're going to flag that as an issue. Or if there's more than three trees in one location, we're going to flag that as an issue. Similarly, with extremely poor trail conditions or um, large amounts of, of trash, that sort of thing, we're, we're going to flag some of these issues. Um, you can also share any of the assessments within the app as a PDF, another cool tool, so that um, a user can, you know, again, take a picture, gather all the information, and then um, share that through their phone, through email, or, or however, um, with either a land manager or a stewardship group that they might work with. 
So that's the app. Um, and the other big component we're going to talk about is, is our kind of the back end pieces of the, the RIMS program. Um, one of those is a web viewer. And this is essentially um, the, the RIMS app in a, in a web browser. Um, you're going to see the same information and, and map and data that you see within the app itself. There's just a little bit more filtering opportunity. You can look at those different issues that we've flagged. Um, and there's a little bit more management capability. So we make this available to land managers and, and some of our volunteer users as kind of the next step in being able to get in and analyze the data. But really the analysis component comes in the form of these backend dashboards. So again, once data is uploaded to the, the RIMS database, um, we can crank and manipulate this, this information in a bunch of different ways um, to build a data story, right? To really be able to not just look at a table of, of thousands of data points, um, but look at charts and graphs and trends over time and aggregate data at different levels, um, you know, at a district level, at a forest level, at a state level if we wanted to, or at a very local level, at a trailhead level, at a municipality level. Um, so a lot of power in these dashboards, and I'll take you through a couple of just examples of what they look like, how you can move through them, that sort of thing. So I want to walk you through some of our online and customizable dashboards that we are setting up for land managers to get access to the RIMS data. Um, we use a program called RI360 um, that hosts the data and then allows us to do just a, a ton of analytics and, and processing of the information. Um, so this is kind of uh, the entryway into a dashboard um, and we'll look through some of the, the different panels and, and things that we've set up. We'll start with just a simple data snapshot. And this allows us to just get a quick look at the information that's coming into RIMS. Um, and this is all of it is a CMC's dashboard. So we're looking at all of the data that is, has ever come in through the app. We've had a total of you know, 4,300 assessments um, and lots of different assessment types, the trail assessments, camping assessments, signs and facilities visitor use, et cetera. We can also display that in a graph formation um, and see those different types of assessments um, as they've come in. Um, we also capture issues within the app. Um, and so we can see the, the different um, types of issues and, and when they've come in um, over time. We can look at those issues in more detail as well. Um, based on the type of issue that was reported um, and how long ago it was reported. Um, we've had a little bit of a lull in the winter. Um, so a lot of the issues that we're capturing on trails and that sort of thing are reported obviously in the, the summer and fall. We can also look at trend data um, over time as different types of assessments come in. Um, you can see this, this really big spike in visitor use um, was related to a volunteer project that we did um, capturing trailhead use uh, near Denver. And so we had a, a big spike that week because we had volunteers really specifically doing visitor use um, work. But you can see on average, you know, we've got, you know, dozens of, of assessments of different types coming in each week. And we can see again those new issues trending over time. And then as we continue to drill in, we'll look in more detail at some of the different assessment types and data within those assessments. So we'll start with camping. And again, we can really you know, pivot and dig into any of the metrics within the RIMS app. These are just some of the ones that we thought would be most useful for land managers as they're looking at this data. Um, so again, we've got kind of our total counts. We can break those up by year or season or month if we wanted to. And we can aggregate some of this big data on the left. So from the you know, nearly 1,300 camping assessments that we've completed, um, we've documented over 100 acres of ground disturbance from those, those 1,200 campsites. Um, so you can see, you know, again, as these numbers get bigger and bigger, you're able to aggregate um, and really have some powerful data to share. 
Um, in the campsite assessment, we calculate an overall impact rating. This is based on the Forest Service um, rapid inventory for campsites. And um, so these ratings are, are based on data that users put into the app. The higher the rating, the higher um, the impact is to natural resources in the surrounding landscape. Um, you know, so it's, it's good to see that we don't have too many assessments in that, that eight um, rating, but we do have quite a bit in kind of this, this mid range. Um, and with any of these numbers, if we're interested in finding out more information, we can click on those 15 um, campsites that were rated as an eight and drill into that information in more detail. So we can see all of the, the locations, and these are mostly county roads um, and data that was submitted um, for all of these specific camping assessments. And now we're just looking at those, those 15 rows with an overall impact rating of eight. We can also look at resource impact. And again, we're, you know, in thinking about how land managers are using this, our expectation is they are gonna prioritize dealing with sites, whether that's decommissioning or rehabilitating sites um, that are having resource impact. So maybe those sites closest to water are gonna be the highest priority um, or sites with erosion and sedimentation. Um, we're gonna kind of flag those. So again, we can look at these in more detail, drill into the data. And then if we go all the way in, we can then put, you know, these, 392 locations onto a map. And the majority of them are in Colorado. We got a couple probably tests over there near Asheville. Um, but as we zoom in, we'll start to see that those are located in different parts of the state. Again, we did a really comprehensive campsite inventory in Chafee County, which is central Colorado. Um, that's why we have such a, a high density of campsites here. Um, we can do a little bit of just basic mapping work here. We can change our base layer to Google Maps if we want to. Um, we can do dots or even do a heat map of where these different campsites are located. Um, and with the dots, we can change the size and we can you know, set the size or the color based on different parameters within the app. Um, so these, again, these are those highest rated um, or these, these um, camp or sites within, within um, close proximity to water. Um, so maybe we also want to look at um, that overall impact rating and set that by color. So now the different colors also indicate the different impact ratings. So now we've got sites close to water. Um, and if we zoom in here, obviously these here are all located, located along a creek. So they're all pretty close to water. Um, but these four um, in this area are these higher impact ratings. So maybe we're gonna really focus in on those, um, get more information, look at the pictures and determine whether we're gonna um, manage or, or decommission those. So back in our camping, um, dashboard here, you know, we can look at waste, we can look at fire rings, um, we have a question about residential use, um, if we have people living on public lands, again, these different um, ratings for ground disturbance and disturbed area, campfire rings, um, size, that, that sort of thing. Um, all of this can be customized um, if, you know, depending on what information is, is most valuable to the land manager. Look at down trees. This is a, a common one. And again, one where we've got just a lot of great information from volunteers who are, who are collecting data. Um, so we've had a total of 764 down trees reported, but we've actually also had 268 down trees that were reported through the app um, kind of removed and, and reconciled. So, so these are the unresolved down trees that, that haven't been addressed yet. Um, we can look at hazard trees and whether we're seeing those at campgrounds 
or on trails. Um, of course, by location, we can look at the total number of downed trees and when those reports were completed. Um, we can sort here. So if we're just interested in finding out the most recent um, report on downed trees, um, looks like we don't have any within the last seven days, but in the last 30 days, we can see that there was a tree reported on, on each of these trails in the last 30 days. Can do things like break up our counts by size. Um, again, so we know what tools um, we wanna send out with, with our crews for those hazard trees or for those, um, for those down trees. We have a pretty basic invasive species report um, where we can break up noxious plants by the, the type um, and then we can see the number of sites as well as the square footage that folks have reported. Again, whether they're associated with campsites or with trails, um, we only have 40 reports currently, but you can start to see that data build over time. Signage. Again, pretty straightforward. We're mainly looking at um, the different types of, of signs that we might have and what condition they're in. Um, so again, you're not probably not too worried about the, the signs in excellent condition, um, but we may wanna pay attention to those post and panels that are in extremely poor condition. We could drill down and again, get all the information that we would need, um, whether the, you know, the panel is missing, what kind of post material we have, and then any notes um, that talk about the issue at that specific sign. Again, we can look at those by location as well. Social trails and roads is a common need that we hear from agencies and understanding where those user created routes are located and how much of an impact they're having, right? So not only how long are they, but how wide are they? And we even have this, you know, what, what constitutes a social road, essentially, if that width is greater than, than eight feet, we can filter on that um, and see that we've got, you know, over a mile of these, these social roads in, in different places. Um, again, looking at location um, and kind of where these reports are coming from, actually the majority of our social trails are um, from campsite reports, um, some from, from trail reports, but a lot, of, um, a lot of those social trails coming from campsites. Trail corridor, really here we're talking about um, kind of encroaching brush, um, whether that's a, you know, woody brush or um, kind of grasses and, and kind of overgrowth on the, the trail. Um, so again, you know, looking at these, these different locations um, and the overall corridor condition gives us a sense for um, the total distance. Um, so we've got a, almost a mile of encroaching brush. Um, so we're gonna need a, a big crew with a lot of loppers in that location. Trail tread and structures is another really commonly used dashboard um, that is gonna, I think, help help land managers really get a better sense for where their trails are, are at and how they can address them most effectively. Um, so we've got you know, these unique trail assessments um, as well as our resurveyed trail assessment. So that's where someone has gone out and either um, reassessed a, a new condition or potentially done work um, to alleviate either a down tree or some you know, erosion or, or tread issues. Um, we can look at these different types of, of issues that we're seeing, you know, and again, drill in um, and just deal with these, these kind of water and mud issues if, if that's our priority. Um, we have a section on trail structures. So understanding, you know, what structures maybe need to be replaced. And here we're looking at just structures in poor or extremely poor condition, right? So these are things that, that people are recommending that, that need work. Um, and then these are new structures that have been recommended, um, you know, mostly check steps in places where we're seeing erosion um, or, or water damage, that, that sort of thing. But folks can recommend those and um, we can get a sense for, for where they need to be located. Let's see if I can refresh. There we go. 
So then this trail assessment by location and recency, again, we can look at, at location here, we can sort that alphabetically if we want to, but we may be more interested in knowing where we've had reports in the last seven days or the last 30 days. A lot of times with the, the trail data, uh, it's really interesting to look at a specific location. So this Ivy Creek Trail um, has you know, 49 assessments on it. That was actually one of our crews that went out and was doing work along the trail, but then also collecting data. Um, and so if we click on that, we can drill into the information in more detail and see what they were noting. So some you know, fair condition reporting, um, but also some extremely poor condition reporting. So erosion, um, in-sloping, narrowing, widening, et cetera. Um, so again, we've got all of this data now in a, in a table format, um, and we can continue to kind of crunch it and manipulate it. We can filter it um, further. But again, you know, here we're just looking at that Ivy Creek Trail, so we've narrowed it down a little bit. Within the dashboards, we can also put that information onto a map um, and do some, some basic mapping, um, coloring and, and things like that. Um, we do have a, a new ArcGIS data feed that I'll talk about in a second, but this uh, mapping with you know itself is, is just kind of a simple way to, to look at the information and start to visualize it a little bit more within the dashboard. I didn't, didn't mention also that you can export all of the information from the dashboards um, into a CSV file. So if you need to use it for anything else or put it into a different program, we can do that. And then finally, we have a, a waste dashboard, um, you know, again, to get a sense for what kind of waste we're seeing out there and the volume, right? We can probably send volunteers um, to pick up one to five gallons of trash and kind of assign them to all these locations. But if there's a truckload or more, if there are couches and, you know, giant, um, giant piles of trash mattresses, that sort of thing, we're probably going to need to send an agency vehicle out there to, to deal with that. Um, you know, if there's any reports of hazmat or, or that sort of thing, maybe we're going to prioritize those and make sure they're, they're dealt with appropriately. Um, and again, looking at the recency and the volume. The last uh, dashboard that I'll show you is, is on visitor use. Um, and this one we're still working with because again, this is where some of the data, um, there's so much of it and it can be so powerful um, that we're figuring out the best way to really, um, to visualize it. Um, so obviously we have kind of our, our total use numbers here at the top. Um, 1,200 visitor use assessments have captured over 6,500 people recreating on, on public lands. Um, all of these vehicles, you know, with and without trailers. When we look at location name, this can get really interesting, especially as you have people going back to do multiple assessments. Um, Mount Bierstadt is a, is a 14er in Colorado, um, and we've only had one assessment at that location, but they counted 300 people in that, that one day. So looking at this average number of people gets really interesting. So Bierstadt comes in at the top, Grays and Tories is another 14er. Um, but as we go down, we'll also see if we look at the, the number of assessments and sort by that. Um, this is uh, an open space and, and parks area near Denver and, and West Denver and Golden. Um, and we did a, a focused visitor use study in this area. Um, so over you know, 186 assessments, um, we counted 251 people. Um, so we're getting you know, one to two people per assessment um, at these locations. But in other areas, this Eagle River Park, every time an assessment happens, we're counting on average 35 people. So you start to see these different densities in, in different locations. If we look at um, visitor use count by, again, location name or activity type, um, this dashboard here is starting to look at, at winter activities and how much we're seeing, you know, as far as Nordic skiing versus backcountry skiing versus snowmobiling versus fat biking. Um, similarly here in the summer, um, hiking comes in at, at number one, um, mountain biking is, is next and Dogs, of course, are, are up there in Colorado. Um, everybody's two dogs to every person recreating, typically. 
Um, and then again, drilling in even more. So now we're looking by location at these different activity types, whether that's winter hiking or backcountry skiing, Oops, sorry. Um, but you can see that based on location type and then get a breakdown for the activity based on that location. Again, with the visitor use, getting some trend data is gonna start to be um, more and more important and more and more interesting. And so here we're looking at the total number of assessments in blue, um, and then the average number of vehicle, or sorry, the, the total number of vehicles in light blue, and then you've got kind of our average. And obviously you can see if there are more assessments, we're counting more vehicles, right? But that average is staying more consistent down here at the bottom. So lots of different examples of, of ways that we can crunch these numbers um, and present the data. Um, and a lot of that really is based on feedback that we get from land managers and how they wanna see this information, how they wanna process it, that sort of thing. One final thing I'll show you in the dashboards um, is just a snapshot of, of kind of our user demographics. So again, you know, we've we've got over 700 people using the, the app. We can get a sense for, um, you know, what types of, of users they are. They can, in their profile, um, let us know if they're into hiking or camping or um, ATV riding um, or other, other uses. Um, and we can look at you know, where they're coming from or what, what zip code are they in. Um, other demographics that, that we can collect there can be really helpful and interesting. And you know, longer term, we can, can start to do some volunteer management through the dashboards as well, understand which users um, are completing reports in which areas, that sort of thing. So those are the dashboards. Um, and the other thing I mentioned is our ArcGIS Online integration. And I'll show you that here. So this is an ArcGIS Online web map that I created using the RIMS data. And every time I reload this map, it pulls um, from a, an updated CSV file to load this data. So every day it's, it's updated at midnight. Um, so we know we're looking at the, the most recent information here. Um, these dots here are color coded by um, assessment type. So we have our trail assessments in red, camping assessments in yellow, signs and facilities in blue, and visitor use in purple. But of course, in ArcGIS Online, you can customize this to look however you want. You can do heat maps. You can you know, only show the camping data if that's what you're particularly interested in. You can obviously clip it for a specific geographic area. Um, so perhaps you're only interested in this, this URA area in Southern Colorado. And we can zoom in and see that info there. If we click on any of these points, we should see the data that comes up, all of the information that was entered by the user, and then any pictures that they submitted. If we click on that picture, it'll take us to a new hyperlink so we can actually kind of see what's, what's going on. So we've got a couple of, of leaners across that trail. And again, this is you know, so, so helpful as we continue to, to build out this data set and we wanna compare the information that's being collected through RIMS with other layers, with other data sources um, in a program like ArcGIS Online. Wanted to go over a few stats um, just based on our experience. We, we launched the app in July of 2019. So we're actually coming up on, on two years, which is really cool. Um, one to just at this point have worked through all the bugs and kinks that come with launching a new mobile app. Um, we've got a, a really stable product that, that folks have been using now for, for two full seasons. Um, but it's also really cool because we're starting to see the, the data and the accumulation of information coming through the app. Um, we've got you know, over 750 users, most of whom have gone through that online training, um, and most of whom are, are obviously located in Colorado at this point. Um, 
but we are expanding our reach and have a couple of new partnerships um, in Alaska and also in Oregon that folks that are using the RIMS app doing a little bit of customization um, to make sure it's it's appropriate for their use um, and yeah really neat um, programs that we're doing there. In total, we've got you know over 4,200 assessments in the app. Um, a lot of those are campsite and trail assessments, but also visitor use assessments. We're seeing more and more of those and starting to really see some cool trend data coming out of those, those visitor use assessments as we have multiple seasons in different locations. Obviously, COVID has had a huge impact on how and where people are, are using public land. So to be able to capture that in RIMS has been pretty neat. <clears throat> and I'll just add, you know, with our the partnerships that we're developing, obviously on the, the land manager side, um, you know, we're looking to set up these dashboards and provide um, information to the land managers because because clearly if we're, we're collecting data, um, it's it's for not if nobody's using it. Right. So we want to get more and more land managers um, either setting up a dashboard or getting set up with that ArcGIS online data service. Um, but then I think, you know, the other component is having local partnerships um, with stewardship groups or academic groups, um, volunteers, that sort of thing has been really key. And I wanted to highlight our partnership with the URA Trails Group. This is a group located in Southwest Colorado. They're an all volunteer run, super small organization in a, in a small community but they are so dedicated to public lands and found a really cool way to use the RIMS app um, just kind of in-house. Um, they have volunteers who go out and do trail assessments with the app, and then they have a, a stewardship crew, again, all volunteers, that go out a couple of weeks later um, and clear clear trees, um, do some light tread maintenance, that sort of thing. But they're really kind of using the app in this full circle way to direct their crews so that they can be more efficient with their time, know how many trees they're gonna come across, know how big of a saw they need to take out with them, those sorts of things. Um, and it's just been really um, a cool kind of process. And then of course the, the forest service in that, that area is also receiving that data, right? And they're able to see that that group cleared out over 250 trees last year and they documented all of that through RIMS. Um, so it's a, a really cool way to integrate that partner group um, and have them, you know, essentially they came up with a data collection plan. They, they assigned certain volunteers to do assessments on certain trails, knowing that those were priorities for the district. Um, and then again, their volunteer group crews or the, the Forest Service trail crews or you know, youth corps or, or whomever can follow up and actually utilize that data on the ground. So a really cool way to, to see it being um, kind of used and, and coming full circle with that data collection and then stewardship work. And that's really the goal, right? Is we wanna to get to that action, um, not, just, not just monitoring and not just collecting data, but, but having good work come from it. So I mentioned kind of this rapid response, um, short-term trail maintenance projects or you know, sign and, and infrastructure improvements. We're seeing that um, happen more and more. Now that we've got a couple of years of data, we're also starting to move into these midterm and longer term um, impacts. So uh, for example, in kind of the midterm, if we're planning for larger trail reroutes or bigger infrastructure projects, the data in RIMS can be really helpful in that planning process. CMC actually used um, data we collected on a trail um, to write a grant, right? We had great pictures. We had really specific trail notes for all of the, the work that needed to be done. We could say there were, you know, 10 switchbacks that needed to be rebuilt and you know um, three water crossings that that needed improvements and um, so we were able to better estimate the amount of time it would take our crews th to do that work any materials and things that they might need ahead of time um, and all of that culminated in a grant application for us to go out and, and do that work this year. 
Um, and then I think, you know, again, even longer term, really looking at these, um, you know, maintenance schedules and costs and long term planning, um, these trends over time as we're seeing dispersed camping um, proliferate, right? Do we need to start to identify which sites we're, we're closing down long term? And do we need to do a NEPA analysis um, and have this, you know, five years of, of monitoring data to back up these, these management decisions that we might be making? Um, so I think we're just starting to see, you know, with two years of data, just starting to see um, how effective that is going to be long term. Um, but I, it's going to be, I think, just really powerful, some of the, the trending and, and stuff over time. So to talk a little bit about um, next steps, as I mentioned, the app is, is totally free and available for download. Um, all of our training materials are, are online and accessible for your staff or for volunteers. And you can start collecting immediately. Um, so right now, we obviously, uh, CMC is based in, in Colorado, but the app is usable nationwide. We are right now working on getting um, an offline map for California. Um, it's a really big state, so we, we may have to break it up a little bit, but the way it works in Colorado right now is you can actually download an offline map so you've still got a base layer while you're while you're out in the backcountry. So we're working on that for California. Um, we've got it in place for Alaska and Oregon and some of these other um, areas where we've been working with local partners. Um, but the app will totally work even without the offline map um, and, and folks can start collecting data today. Um, the next step, of course, is then managing and, and utilizing the data. So setting up those custom dashboards, um, doing automated reports and mapping and, and data export and that sort of thing. Um, and in that respect, that's kind of where CMC can come in to, to help set that up for different land managers in your area. Um, and then, of course, reporting and implementing, right? Again, we can, can set all this up and do as much data collection as we, we want, but if we're not really responding to it, um, then you know, we're not utilizing it as, as best we can. So um, our hope is really for this to kind of come full circle and, and get to that action phase where people are, are using um, the app to, to do good work, do stu good stewardship work and, and good planning work on the ground. If you're interested in learning more about the app, um, I would love to, to chat with you and talk through how you might be able to use it in your area. If you're interested in getting a custom dashboard set up, et cetera, we can talk through all of that. My contact information is here on the slide. Um, and you can also go to cmc.org slash app. That'll get you um, to all the information, the, the training information, um, the, the videos and, and quiz and um, other, other data and reports and things that we've put together. So um, yeah, we're super excited to be able to share this with you and, and hope it is something that you could find useful in your area. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me with any questions and um, we'll answer some questions that came in through the chat as well. Thanks.